So thank you for coming. With the new arrangement of uh, courses and mini seminars this year, I think the speaker's biggest fear is getting into a room and having only themselves and the other speaker to participate in the session. So we're very happy that some other poor, susceptible, gullible minds have thought there might be value in attending this uh, course. So thank you for coming. So this is a dual effort this year. Uh, myself, Rich Rosenfeld. I was editor of the journal for eight years and had the great pleasure to turn it over to, and that's the Academy Journal at Laryngology Head and Neck Surgery, to turn it over to Dr. Jack Krause, who took over as editor just about a year ago. Yep. And I'd been doing this course for a number of years, and we decided as a nice transition we would both do it. So we've split up the, the content. Just to know who's here, how many of you are resident physicians? Oh, great. Raise your hand. And you're not all in the last row. That is a very encouraging thing. Okay. So how many are young physicians, meaning you've been in practice, you know, less than 10 years? Fair amount. How many don't fit into those categories? Raise your hands. Ah, the old folks. Okay, good. The seasoned folks. So welcome. Uh, well, hopefully we'll give some information that's of use to you regardless of your stage and training. And what we'd like you to get out of this is basically to have some enthusiasm about peer review, because we always need reviewers at the journals, and to enjoy it, and to hopefully learn how to do it efficiently. Uh, I think it's good for you, for your careers, your chairs, if you're in academic medicine, will appreciate it. If you're not in academic medicine, doing peer review will allow you to more critically think about and evaluate the literature so you don't fall for oh, the, all of those articles that aren't so peer-reviewed. Um, so we hope you get something out of it. We'll try and leave plenty of time for questions. And uh, I think we're going to start off. Uh, Dr. Krauss will start. Let's see. First, no disclosures. We don't make any money off of peer. Actually, you make money off of peer review. Yeah. Right? They pay you to do this stuff at the academy. Your academy dues I go to him. Fortune. Yeah, he just rolls in the dough. and. You know, but I don't think any of us do this for uh, for profit uh, peer review. It's it's a cost, so no disclosures. And we'll start off with uh, Dr. Kraus. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rosenfeld. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to speak, but it's always a hard act to follow with Rich. So uh, thank you for inviting me this year. Did I have a choice? No. Um, <laughs> okay. So what we want to do is really go step by step through what you should be thinking of as reviewers. And there really is a very nice algorithmic way you can do this. There are certain key items that you want to be aware of as you do re your reviews. And attention to that kind of detail is really going to make you a successful reviewer. So we're going to talk about peer review, relevance to mission. We're going to talk about uh, validity of the studies and what that means, levels of evidence, and ethical conduct. So this may be you submitting a paper. And as you submit that paper, you need to run the gauntlet to try to get that through. And you have reviewers and associate editors and deputy editors and editors all trying to keep you from getting there, or so it seems. But believe it or not, this is a process that we really try to facilitate your paper getting published. And if there is really a good core in that paper, we try to do what we can to work with you to make that paper better. And I think a good reviewer not only reviews and, and vets papers for the journal, but improves the quality of the research itself. And hopefully that's something that you can do. So, you know, what is peer review? What is it that we're going to be talking about today? Basically, it's an active process. It's a process that has been used for centuries in order to vet and, and evaluate the scientific literature. And it is a process that is done differently in, by different journals, by different people. But in, in essence, it's a group of people who have similar backgrounds to the authors of the paper who review the paper in certain areas. They're looking at the scientific methods of the paper. They're looking how subjects were selected. They're looking at whether or not this was done in an ethical manner and how the data were evaluated, were the statistics done in a proper way? Are the conclusions that are drawn based on those statistics appropriate? So these are the kind of questions you're going to be asking yourself, and we'll go over those with you here in the next hour. So when you submit a, a, a paper as an author, it comes into the journal office, and then it's assigned 
at least in the white journal, it's assigned next to an associate editor. And we have about 15 associate editors in different content areas, so they have different levels of expertise and review and, and edit in a certain uh, scope. And then they send that out to two reviewers, to two individuals like you, who then look at the paper and evaluate it against a set of benchmarks that we're going to go over with you today, submit that back to the associate editor, with their comments and their suggestion on, the, on whether to revise, to reject, to accept. And then the associate editor, editor prepares his or her analysis, and that comes to me now. It came to Rich for eight years. It goes to the editor-in-chief next, and a decision is made. So what this allows us to do is use people with content expertise and people who know how to look for key elements of a paper in order to make recommendations on whether or not a journal should accept that. It often seems like you have a, an 800-pound gorilla in the room when you're doing this. But again, it's something that is a process that, when done properly, is a fair and hopefully unbiased process. And we're going to talk a bit about bias as well. So what's a peer? Many of you have read Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. I've read this as a freshman in college. I probably read it twice since then. I still don't understand it. But <laughs> that's not the point. The point is that Kuhn describes a peer as a disinterested, meaning unbiased, intellectual equal. That's what a peer is. So in peer review, the idea is that you as an individual re reviewing someone's paper should have a similar set of knowledge. You should have some content expertise in the area under study. You should have some expertise in research methodology, and therefore you are acting then as a, as, a, as a peer reviewer, and that's the concept of peer review. And the more stringent the quality of the journal, the, the higher the impact of the journal, the higher the reach of the journal, generally the more stringent the peer review process. So if you're submitting for Nature or Science or the New England Journal of Medicine, it's going to have a different review process than something like the ENT journal will have. So, there are types of peer review. Most otolaryngology journals use what's called single-blind review. And what that means is that the reviewers know who the authors are. When the, when the paper's submitted, they know the authors, who they are, where they're from. But the reviewers do not know who the, the, the authors do not know who the reviewers are. And that's single-blind review. And with the exception of JAMA Odo, the major ENT journals use single-blind review. JAMA Odo uses double-blind review. And double-blind review means that neither party, neither the authors nor the reviewers, know who each other are. So the, the, the cover page, if you will, is taken off the paper before the reviewers see it. What this, uh, th this anonymity or supposed anonymity is felt to, by some people, improve the process and decrease bias. But what you'll find is many reviewers in this setting can figure out who the authors are by, this, by the type of research, the nature of what they're studying, who, who they cite, what they cite. Self-citation is something that's common, and it winds up being a game to figure out who does it. And in fact, when you look at the evidence regarding the quality or the validity of single versus double-blind review, there really is no significant difference. So that's why most of us do use single-blind review. And then there's open review where everybody knows who everybody is. And that's not commonly used, but it's something that perhaps may be seen more frequently. And the idea then is that, well, you're not going to say something you, d you wouldn't want to say, but in the same manner, you're not necessarily going to be as pointed in your critique if people know who you are that's, that's reviewing. Now, it doesn't actually look at the validity of the work. And, you know, I can't tell if the work is fraudulent necessarily. You know, there I had a researcher I knew, and she was doing something in neurological research and taking the same specimens and same slides and submitting them for different studies. And eventually an astute peer reviewer a couple publications in found they were the same slides that had been reused. And then the fraud was determined, and that person was then disbarred by the NIH and, you know, fraudulent scientific misconduct. But that's usually not disclosed in peer review. Um, it doesn't necessarily say that the results are correct. What it says is internally they're valid, that, that the methodology suggests that they were done in a way that's appropriate. 
And hopefully that if the sampling was correct, you can take those and generalize them to a larger audience. So those are things you can say, but in order to say whether that is a correct hypothesis, it's going to take replication, redoing it in different studies, you know, there are processes to do that. And hopefully peer review eliminates bias, but that's not a guarantee because there is jealousy, there is competition among researchers. And we also have unconscious bias. Sometimes we're just biased against something for reasons we're not even aware of. That's something that's important. But we try to be as, you know, as sensitive as possible to eliminating, uh, eliminating bias in the process. So, you know, five stages of peer review. Here you are submitting, you know, denial. Oh no, I didn't find the version of the manuscript except a what? Okay. Bargaining, response to the reviewer, we performed seven of the 21. Depression, oh no, this paper. And then finally, at the end of the day, acceptance, you know. So remember the five stages of peer review. Actually, peer review was surveyed. About 4,000 researchers responded. In, in, in the world's literature, there are about 1.3 scientific publications each year. It's a, a large number. And in this survey, about 84% of people do say peer review plays a, a, an important role. And without peer review, it would be difficult in order to really have a scientific body of knowledge that you could trust. 91% um, think that their papers are improved by peer review. And I, I would say, I would agree with that. I think a good peer review process improves the quality of the paper. Um, some, you know, some majority does prefer double blind. So relevance to mission, and you know, we're going to check things off. This is our mission for the White Journal for Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. We publish contemporary, ethical, clinically relevant information in otolaryngology that can be used by otolaryngologists, scientists, and clinicians to improve patient care and public health. So what we're saying here, we're not a basic science journal. So we're not publishing basic science that does not have clinical relevance. We may have basic science papers. But one of the things we will always comment back on in those is to make a clear case for the clinical relevance of the work you're doing. And if you can't do that, if this is much more early research, probably not best suited for our journal. So think about what is the mission of the journal you're submitting to. Is this a clinical journal? Is it a basic science journal? Is it a public health journal? You know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish by choosing that? And this is just an array of publication types that we use. In general, we are seeing a, an uptick in original research. We're seeing an uptick in both systematic and state-of-the-art reviews. We're seeing a decline in case reports. So that you're seeing a shift in the quality of the research toward being more rigorous quality research. And we accepted this year a significant num greater, significantly greater number of systematic reviews than the year before. I think this is something Dr. Rosenfeld set as a mission early in his editorship, really improving the quality of the reviews that we have, and that's certainly a value that I'm going to adhere to as we move forward. These are the kind of papers that really make a difference in our specialty. So with that being said, I'll call Dr. Rosenfeld back, and we'll have him proceed from there. No, I know. All right, so as peer reviewers, your first uh, step should be to see if the manuscript is relevant. So you get that request to review. You, you look at the manuscript. Wow, this looks great, but it's really a bad choice for the journal. Don't waste your time reviewing it. You know, just briefly respond to the editor and say, you know, I think this is really a bad fit. Uh, it doesn't belong in the journal. You don't have to go further than that. If it's clearly a bad fit, if there's a doubt, then you can express that opinion, but still review it. So you've decided it's worth reviewing, and now there's internal validity. So you're going to look in, and these are things that we look for in the Otolaryngology and Neck Surgery Journal. I think they're fairly universal truths as far as assessing manuscripts, but they might not be as explicit in other settings. So first thing you look at as a reviewer is the methods, right? I mean, the methods are where it all lies. I mean, the other stuff is interesting, but the methods should be detailed. So you get a paper with these three lines of methods, uh, you immediately realize that there's major problems and you're not going to spend a lot of time in this review. Uh, 
if the methods are so complicated you can't understand them, then you're probably also not going to spend enough to, a lot of time in the review. You're going to respond back to the editorial office and say, you really need to find somebody who understands this. I don't. Uh, so look at the methods. They should be clear to you. They should be detailed enough that if you decided to reproduce this study, I have no idea why you'd ever want to do that, but if you did, you would be able to because it's so clear. So that's, that's important. One way to ensure clarity is to have reporting standards. So for randomized controlled trials, there are standards called consort, and there are groups primarily of epidemiologists around the world who get together and think of all these standards. There are standards for systematic reviews. There are standards for con control trials. There are standards for reporting diagnostic test assessments. There are standards for observational studies in some cases. So lots of standards out there. At the journal, at least at the Academy Journal, we do ask that authors adhere to the consort standards if they're going to submit a randomized controlled trial, um, which ask that the authors of the trial disclose things like how they randomized the patients. Did they conceal the allocation from the investigators? Was there blinding, masking? Very importantly is this participant uh, flow issue, which is shown here. So it's a flow chart showing what happened to every patient in the study. So as editor, if I did not see this diagram in there, I would spend a lot of time on looking at it. I'd write back and say, you know, we adhere to the consort standards. You need to include this diagram or we really can't go further. So. If, you're, if the journal you're reviewing for it does have standards, be familiar with them and, and make sure people adhere to them. Anybody able to answer this question? What's the most common article published in otolaryngology journals? The, the, the type, it kind of rolls off the tongue. What's it called? Go, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just blurt things out here. Oh, did you just, what'd you say? A retrospective review, doesn't it kind of, a retrospective review, it kind of rolls right out there, right? Uh, only two problems with that. First, it's not retrospective. Second, it's not a review. Otherwise, it's a great title for the majority of articles. So this is a personal peeve. I have no idea if the current editor is going to continue yes, this. We do. We do. Um, yes. But this retrospective mm -hmm. review, so you get an article to review, one of the things you're going to look at in the abstract or methods is the study design because it helps you review it. And they say, we did a retrospective review. Well, it's not. It's either a case series with review of the, the charts or records or EHR or whatever they did, or less commonly, it's a case series where they actually planned it out and took the time to collect the data prospectively. Two very different types of study designs. Uh, neither is retrospective. A retrospective study means that you begin with an outcome and then you look backwards to see what caused it. Most of these are cohorts. You're starting at some defined group of patients and following them forward. So it is not retrospective and it's certainly not a review. So I, I like to see it distinguished as either a chart review or planned data because if it's chart review, there's more a opportunity for bias clearly than a, a planned study. Then you get these, right? So this is the great experience with uh, Procedure X, Disease Y, you know, published in the Journal of Anecdotal and probably meaningless results. But nonetheless, it's a retrospective review, uh, a case series with chart review of 38 patients with this really cool thing. I think it's uh, booth 132 in the exhibit hall. They, they're an IRT uh, a supporter of the academy, so they have a really big booth. It's really cool might have the word robot in it somewhere, I don't know. And it's, it's NIH funded, IRB approved, everybody likes it. Friends, relatives, enemies, they're all begging for it, right? So, uh, and 90% got better. So, yeah, it's it. and then the conclusion is it's safe and effective, right? Oh my gosh, these drove me crazy. Thank God they don't drive me crazy anymore. They're gonna drive him crazy. So, uh, you know, can you do something to 10 patients, 20 patients, 50 patients, 100 patients, 200 patients, and then conclude it's safe and effective? The answer is no. All right? Safety is a tough ax to grind. To convince me something was safe, if maybe 10 people did it in 10 different parts of the world or 10 different practice environments with a whole lot of people with different levels of experience and training, then I'd believe it was safe. 
if the person paid for and funded by the company that invented this crazy machine and spent years learning how to do it, did it 30 times and didn't have a complication, that doesn't help me very much, okay? And efficacy, that's a whole different ballgame. So if you're looking at a case series, at a, at a, at a, whether it's uh, 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 done with active follow-up or a chart review, you look for a few things. Is there a well-defined sample, preferably consecutive? Do we have enough detail to understand what was done or all the patients accounted for? Is there a big loss to follow up from the initial group? And is the analysis uh, multivariate? Those of you snapping pictures of the slides, it's, it's, it's very flattering, but uh, you're welcome to. But this is available online. You can download the whole slides and everything. Uh, uh, it is there. And are the conclusions justifiable? So you can't talk about efficacy if you just do a series of patients. doesn't happen. Because you have a four-letter word with a B, bias, which means a systematic deviation from the truth. Systematic deviation from the truth, that's all bias is. And that's what you want to try and minimize. And be sure is minimized when you review an article. That's all it is. Very simple. And it can happen lots of ways, lots of ways. Here are some of the ways we deal with a lot of treatment studies where people would like to convince you and the rest of the known universe that what they do is a good idea, right? That's why people publish. Um, some of it's altruism, a lot of it's ego, right? You do something, it works, and you say, wow, this is great. The rest of the world should do what I do, and then it would be a better place. So you try and convince people of that. The problem is there's often a lot of bias that goes into that. You can design a study in a way to really show what you want. Classic example, industry-funded studies. There are people that get paid a lot of money in companies to design studies that a priori they know it's going to show what they want. And there are lots of tricks you can do in the way you select your sample and so forth. Ascertainment bias is using a, a somewhat skewed sample. We want to make conclusions about this big population, but the sample we draw is not representative. It's a very select sample that we think is going to show what we want to show. Allocation bias is why we randomize, so you have a choice of treatment A versus treatment B. You know, if it's not randomized, there are lots of factors that can go into the decisions. You know, oh yeah, radiation is great for tumors, and as we randomize, why don't we pick those slightly smaller, more favorable tumors and put them in the radiation group, and those really messy ones, give them to the surgeon so it looks bad. Observer bias is the person measuring the outcomes. They can affect, uh, you know, you round up if, it, if it's what you like, you round down if you don't like it. And reviewer bias is the way you uh, put together your discussion section uh, and you select only articles that seem to support your point of view. So these are things to look for in reviewing a manuscript. Once you get past that, you get into the never, never, never land of statistics. Um, that you can blame on these two characters for the most part, Ron Fisher, who studied agricultural plots. Uh, in the early 20th century and came up with p-values, which can be summarized as this, the strength of evidence against a null hypothesis. doesn't exactly roll off the tongue and into the brain, but it, it's a few words. It's parsimony. So if the null hypothesis is there's no difference that this treatment is completely ineffective compared to placebo, and we get a p-value of 0.01, it means there's only a 1% chance that this null hypothesis is false, meaning that there is something going on. If it's 0.05, we say, well, there's a 5% chance it's not effective. And in medicine, we arbitrarily pick 5% as our tolerance, which can be silly many times. An alternative and an adjunct are confidence intervals, which are very simply defined as a plausible range of values. So I might say that treatment A uh, gave a 25% success rate and B was 15%, right? So I would say the difference in that case is 10%. And the p-value may be 0.03. All right, so it's non-trivial. But I'd much rather know the confidence limits on that difference. So that difference of 10%, if it has confidence limits of 8 to 12, and the plausible range of values consistent with the data are 8 to 12, that's very different than if it's 1 to 19. Because that low end 1 could be meaningless. So that tells me that that range of values, that confidence interval, could be consistent with meaningless results. 
my enthusiasm is now much less limited regardless of the p-value. That's why confidence limits are important. I love This appeared in a journal that I won't name um, recently, and, and it's nothing against the journal. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff here. It's just this, I couldn't resist when I saw this. Um, the article was on the cover, and it concluded that improvement in chronic rhinitis was noted in almost 80% of kids. The allergic rhinitis patients improved to a much higher extent than those with non-allergic. It was 86 versus 76, but it wasn't statistically significant. All right, well, come on. If it ain't statistically significant, it didn't happen. And don't ever let anyone use the word trend. If they use the word trend, go into attack mode. No trends. P equals 0.06 is not a trend. And that trend has continued. The trend has continued. So trends, nope. you know, this is, this is wishful thinking. This is not thing. Small samples can be a little trouble. So when you get these studies with, you know, you know five subjects or six or three or eight, you've got to look at them a little differently. And, you, you know, most of them can only generate hypotheses. You really can't test a lot of stuff with a very small sample often not very generalizable. You certainly are not going to get power precision out of it. Uh, can there be an analysis sometimes with exact methods? Um, and is it appropriate? So a small there's, you can publish small sample studies. It, it, there's nothing wrong with it, but they're often you know, feasibility, hypothesis generating, and they have to be fairly unique and important to warrant publication. If not, you know, wait till you get a bigger sample, then publish it. You don't need to be a statistician, but you should know something. Uh, this is a book I found very helpful, uh, How to Report Statistics in Medicine. It's helpful at two levels. One, if you're trying to publish something and you have that Cox regression analysis in there, it'll show you what table to use to put in your article to describe your Cox regression analysis and what to say in the results section. Conversely, if you're a reviewer and they come up with this generalized linear model that you have no idea what the heck they're talking about, you look it up in here and it tells you very quickly what it, what it is and shows you the, the type of table that should be reported and the other relevant things. So it's pretty useful to have that kind of information. You can also decline and say to the editor, listen, this is beyond me, we need a statistician. I'm always skeptical of figures, graphs, and tables. They're supposed to add to a manuscript, but often they're superfluous. The big one that gets me is the list. A list is not a table, okay? One column of information is not a table. That belongs in your results section. Tables have to have at least two parameters, and it should enhance your understanding of data. It's not there to just throw it out in a big blob. So you have to know how to create tables, and especially, there's a science to this. This guy, Edward Tufte, uh, published beautiful things on, on how to create tables, figures, illustrations. There's other sources out there that are available very readily, but be skeptical of tables if it's just one column. That, that's not, that doesn't belong there. Systematic reviews are great. I'm going to say a few words about that because if, you know, you just copy from one, you, you go to jail. You copy from two, you have a publication. You know, it's good. It's, that's, why, that's why residents love systematic reviews. You don't need IRB approval either. And we like them at the journals because they get citations. And that's what it's all about, citations. And we have guidelines for systematic reviews, which are fairly explicit. And they ask for certain methods, explicit search criteria, inclusion and exclusion. It's, it's very well laid out. Uh, this is not a narrative review article. Some journals accept narrative reviews. Uh, many do not. There's plenty of seats up here if you want to join us. We're glad you're here. Uh, so if you're, if you're reviewing a systematic review, it's more than just reading it and saying, this is a good article, I agree with it, it looks good. If you don't know systematic review methodology, Either learn some, become a Cochrane Scholar at the Academy, take the systematic review course I do with Martin Burton every year that we did yesterday, uh, or find somebody who does. But there's a method to the madness. And just like for, rand for randomized trials, there's reporting standards for systematic reviews that, uh, that we should adhere to. I, I believe in the author instructions it says we adhere to it. I'm not positive, but the PRISMA. Uh, which again is a group of uh, epidemiologists that get together and say, how should the rest of the world report these? The, the key point here is a flow diagram, just like a randomized trial. Randomized trial, the unit of analysis is typically 
patients. So the flow chart shows you what happened to all your patients. What's the unit of analysis typically in a systematic review or meta-analysis? Papers, articles, right. So it starts by showing you how many were identified, how you screened them, how you got rid of them, you know, what happened when they looked at the full text, how many did you end up with the end, you know, blah, blah. Um, it's very thorough in that way. And it should eliminate all doubt as to how those articles, because that's the real bias. The key to meta-analysis, systematic review, is not fancy statistical analysis. The key is how you select the articles. That's what determines bias. It's far more important. And this just shows how it affects the impact factor of a journal. Journals live and die by the impact factor. Fortunately, ours was very good this year. It passed two for the first time ever. Uh, individual authors live and die by what metric? Anybody know? H-index. That's the measure of individual productivity. You ever want to really get depressed? Go download a program called Publish or Perish. It's free. Publish or Perish. And you can put it on your computer and find your own H-index, which basically says how many times you've published X X papers that have been cited the same amount. So an H index of eight would mean you published eight papers that have been cited at least eight times by others. It's good for academic individual productivity. This is my tie in to case reports, which speaks to the value about they're nice, but you know, we're often very, very misled by one or two experiences, and that's what case reports are. We still publish some. I think when I took over the journal about nine years ago, there was a backlog, I think, of about 150 case reports that had been accepted by the prior editor, mm -hmm. and we had to publish them. I think we're down to, what, one or two an issue now, maybe? Eleven in the last year. Eleven in the last year. So they're rare. Why? I mean, they're nice. They're interesting. You know, they, they can occasionally present something real new and exciting, but most of the time they're not. And for journals, it's a death blow because nobody cites them. And if nobody cites it, it really hurts your impact factor. Uh, the case reports not to submit are these, you know, the I am a clever chap case, the goodness book of medical records case. Are you still doing the, the clinical photos and stuff? So occasionally you got a Guinness book of medical records photo. You can, you know, send that there. But uh, a, t a case report, if you do get one to review, should really begin by immediately letting you know why it's worth publishing. What's unique about it? What's important about it? A brief account and, you know, you never want to see case report and review the article. That's the death blow, in my opinion, to publishing because the case, re the case report is fine. If it's great, publish it. But a review, if it's not a systematic review, I'm not interested. I think Dr. Krauss is more interested in non-systematic reviews than I am. Actually, actually less than Oh, he's less. Used. He's less than it used to be. His, his enthusiasm is winning. That's Way. good. There's hope for the next... Uh, uh, seven years, good. Uh, Dr. Krauss mentioned briefly certain journals, and the Academy Journal is one, is not primarily a basic science journal, but you may get asked to review these, and they may seem relevant. I'd say questions reviewers should ask is, do I find this interesting or important? And if it's not, it, it's probably not worth publishing. And that's usually the job, it's the job of the authors to convince you it's interesting and important. If you get into it and it's like, wow, I, I get it, got to get a few more degrees to read this article, it's, it's a problem. You know, can it relate to patient care? Often they have animal models, and that's fine, but it, it needs to be a proper model that has the right generalizability. I find a lot of times sample sizes are not well justified to me, which is very bizarre. It's often justified by the size of the number of cages they have for the animals in the research lab or the budget, which only pays for three monkeys instead of the 24 you would have needed to come up with a valid conclusion. So I'm very skeptical. I like to see sample size, sample size estimates, and statistical analysis uh, in these. Um, I find a lot of uh, small groups done with parametric statistics is a problem, mm -hmm. and then they start doing all these intergroup comparisons, which you can't do. You need statistical methods for that. External validity. I think I do that, and then we go back to you, right, for the last two. So you've convinced yourself the article is well done, not in the sense of a Texas stake, but in the sense of a well-conducted study that has internal validity. And now you say, all right, it's internally valid, is it going to help anyone else but the authors? 
Right? Internal validity means that for the sample they studied and the place they studied it, the way they did the study, it's valid. That's nice. But if it's going to be a useful study, it has to be generalizable. It has to be applicable to other people in other places. Otherwise, why publish it? So that's what external validity is about. So inside the study, we have the internal. Then we have outside as the external. And it's only useful if we can, you can use it. You know, and we go through journal club with our residents and say, okay, it's a good study. So does this help us take care of better, better patient care? And eight out of ten times the answer is no. And we look at each other, why they publish it? And then they look at me and say, you published it. It was in the white journal. And I say, oh, okay. Get, pull some articles from Laryngoscope next time, please. And this is the way to think about it. You know, ultimately we study a sample, but we want to get to conclusions about a big population at the end. And in the process of doing that, we find some things in our study, we analyze it, and if it's true, we have internal validity, truth in the study. But then we have to go on to say, does this apply to the, we studied these patients, we had access in our area to all these patients, can we apply it to that bigger sample? If the answer is yes, then can we actually apply it to the target population out there? And this is called inference in science. Inference is simply moving from observations to a generalization. And that's the way you make progress, by making observations and then reporting them in a way that leads to generalizations. Here's an example of an industry-funded study. It's a good study uh, for draining ear tubes, looking at um, um, Ciprodex, ciprofloxacin dexamethasone, versus ofloxacin. And at the time, the manufacturer was very interested in showing the benefits of adding dexamethasone to the product. So they did a nice study. You know, They got a whole bunch of people, 600 kids with drippy ears and tubes, and they randomized them to their product versus the comparator. And uh, what happened? Well, if we look on the right, the first thing they did was 30% of them didn't have a positive culture when they started the study. So they chucked them out. Okay? How does that affect the generalizability of the results? It's a big problem. Unless you routinely only treat culture positive draining years in your practice, this study may not apply. So that's a big problem. And then they went ahead and looked at various things and uh, found a difference in clinical cure and so forth, bacterial cure. And the cure, of course, had nothing to do with how the patient felt. The cure had to do if you took an otoscope or a microscope and saw one micron of fluid in the ear, that was a failure, and if it was dry, it was a cure. So is that clinically relevant? I don't know. Maybe not. Um, anyway, you, you see a study like this, and you have to think very carefully about the uh, external validity, especially with bacterial cure. You know, bacterial cure is relative to a microbiologist, but if the patient feels fine, is it relative to the patient? No. And a lot of people with bacterial failures feel fine and they get better on their own. So, you know, just some external validity. In a lot of these bacteriologic studies, we start with a big intent to treat sample. And then we say, gee, did they meet all the criteria that we want to include them? No. Okay, get rid of them. Gee, do they have a positive culture baseline? No, get rid of them. You know, oh boy, did they actually take the medications and show up for follow-up? Uh, no, all right, get rid of them. And then we have what's called a per-protocol analysis, which can be very, very, very biased. So in these types of studies, as a reviewer, you look for what's called intention to treat analysis, meaning everybody who entered the study appears in the final statistics, numerators, denominators. These are just some things on external validity. I, I had published this in Bailey's. I have a chapter on this, and then there's a review article you can that we published a, a few years back. Um, oops, that was too quick on that. Go back. There we go. So just some things in external validity, a little of the selection, the sampling. Consecutive samples are generally best. Uh, describing and, and, and emphasizing clinical significance. I think you can generalize better when you have confidence intervals, right? The plausible range of values rather than just p-values. And adverse events aren't often reported the way they should be. Okay. So, do I do the level of evidence? I think I do level of evidence. You do level right? of evidence. Oh, okay. All right. No, I've got to keep going. All right. So, level of evidence. This is quick. Uh, in thinking about whether something should be published, it has to have a meaningful addition to what you know. If there are already 43 case reports, uh, 72 uh, uh, case series with chart reviews, and 42 cohort studies published, and someone publishes the 43rd cohort study, 
Who cares? You know, generally it would now be if they did a randomized trial and it was the first one, that would be exciting. So you need to know where does it fit compared to what else has been published. And you can do this, uh, I think the best way to look at this is with the definitions from the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, updated in 2011. And the pinnacle of existence is called the systematic review. A higher level of evidence than individual trials, individual cohort studies, individual cross-sectional studies. Why? Because once you have a body of evidence and it's consistent, uh, that says a lot more than an individual study. You know, you need consistency and diversity to really conclude that something is really there. And you may notice that the levels of evidence differ, whether it's a treatment, a harm study. I have a very big bugaboo against an unnamed journal that insists on publishing a level of evidence mm -hmm. with every article. Mm -hmm. If one of your residents or somebody wanted to do a great study, go back, look at 100 articles, and see if the levels of evidence are correct. I guarantee you 50% of them will be wrong. All right? It's a meaningless thing. Levels of evidence are not you know, something you just throw out there to tell people something's important. You can have a case series that's very well done, that's more important, and uh, as it shows here, an observational study with dramatic effects can be as important as a randomized trial, and more important than a poorly designed randomized trial, which is often cited as level one evidence, even though, as you can see here, it's level two. Level one would be a systematic review of randomized trials. Uh, if you want to learn about systematic reviews, this is an older book. It's going on uh, 30 years. It's one of the first things I read on it. I published my first systematic review in 1991, a while ago. Um, it basically just puts forth the step that if you want science to progress, it's cumulative. Every study doesn't occur in a vacuum, and you need to synthesize it, and that's the role of systematic review. So now I'll go back to Dr. Right. Krauss for okay. ethical conduct and to tie it up. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, Rich. No, that's that's perfect. Um, so we're going to move into other elements that it's important for you for you to look at, and I think Rich did a great job looking at the kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the mechanics of the review, what are the elements that are important for you to look at in, in terms of validity and generalizability. But you're also responsible as reviewers for vetting the ethical conduct of the work. And, and it's clear that this is important. And you all know that, that if you're doing studies, you need to have institutional review board or IRB approval or animal care committee approval. But that's not necessarily done in the same kind of careful manner from site to site to site and an institutional review board may do a much better job than a for-profit regional review board so it's something that you really do want to think about as you're as you're reviewing the white journal as are many otolaryngology journals is a signatory to the agreement with the committee on publication ethics we're a member of this group and this is an international group that has ethics and publication how your research is done how you review papers, how you look at bias. Um, many, many things go into the into the COPE guidelines. And not all otolaryngology journals are COPE signatories. So it's something that, you know, just for your interest level. And we know that ethical conduct in research has been important for many, many years. Um, and these are a few of the reports and the uh, declarations and codes that have been promulgated over the years. Um, and I, I have them there more for your interest than anything, because we know that in the past, in the name of medicine, terrible things have been done to people. And uh, we recently published an article by one of Dr. Rosenfeld's faculty on some of the uh, experimentation in Nazi Germany. And hopefully you've seen that. It was in the July issue this year. But when we look at ethical conduct, really, what do we mean by that? Well, does the experiment have value to society. You need to look at that. Is this something that's important? Is it clinically valuable? Because if you're going to take subjects and you're going to put them at harm, you know, what is the ethics of that? And if the benefit that you're going to gain is small relative to the risk you put the subjects to, is that ethical? So these are all questions as reviewers you're going to look at. And do the method, does the methodology of the study support the clinical importance of the study, or is there an ethical disconnect there? And that certainly is something you should look at. We know that IRB approval or 
animal care committee approval is mandatory, or let's say review is mandatory for all published studies. It's not up to the author to determine whether or not a study needs IRB approval. It's up to the IRB to determine whether or not the study needs IRB approval. So when you're reviewing a paper, they can't simply say that this study is exempt from IRB. They need to say that we've submitted this to our IRB and they deem it exempt. And those are two widely different things. Now, systematic review is not, you know, in, is not something that needs IRB approval. So that large de-identified database studies do not necessarily need IRB approval. So there are guidelines to that, and institutional values vary. So you know, be aware of where you're at. Some of the other elements of ethical conduct, and we're going to talk about each of these next, are disclosure of relationships. Do you have industry or other relationships that put you in a conflict of interest? So when you read a study, such as Rich said, and that study comes in from a, an undisclosed local pharmaceutical company, and it looks at an eardrop. You know, is that done in such a way that the the people doing the study are on the dole from the company sponsoring the research? That doesn't necessarily invalidate the research, but it raises a question about the research, and you need to have those disclosed. We'll talk about that. Who is an author? How many authors are on a paper? What is the contribution of those? That's something you should evaluate as you look at it. Is this something that's been done before? Have parts of this been done and published before? Is this frankly plagiarized and how are patient rights upheld? All, all relationships that are held by the authors of a paper must be disclosed. So when you're looking at reviewing the paper, you want to look at the disclosures of the authors. And if you're aware that perhaps they're not disclosing something, then that's an ethical breach. One of the things you'll hear from authors sometimes is, well, I only put in there the disclosures that were relevant. And who is it that determines whether a disclosure is relevant? It's the reader. It's not the author. So you need to put all of them in, and you need to make sure that the authors put all of them in and let us as the users of that information determine whether they're relevant or not. So that's something to look at. You'll see that. Um, these interred industry involve industry relationships. They involve grant funding. They involve uh, being consultants to boards. They involve all of those because there is a potential for bias in those situations. And what about non monetary relationships. Is there a potential for bias there? And the answer is absolutely yes. Let's say you've authored a paper, for example, on uh, supporting abortion in certain circumstances, and you are sitting on the board of Planned Parenthood, and you may not get paid by Planned Parenthood, but you think there might be an inherent bias in that relationship. So that's a, perhaps a non-monetary relationship that clearly is relevant to the research, and those are things that are important to disclose, too. Many people sit on advisory boards and on other kinds of things that may, in fact, bias their, their response, and that's something you need to look for. Now, what about criteria for authorship? As you're looking at papers, you want to look at the contribution of all the folks who are being listed as authors on the paper. And you'll sometimes see a list of 15 people on a paper and there are 10 subjects. And, uh, you know, you're, they're, they're, you have more people that are, that are claimed on the paper than were in the research. And again, if you can support that in some way, that's not necessarily irrelevant. But there are concerns about that. And there are several concerns about that. And there are actually guidelines that help us to determine whether or not someone should be listed as an author. And these are uh, related to the relevant role that the individual plays in the manuscript in terms of the design of the research, in terms of the conduct of the research, in the writing of the manuscript, the review of the manuscript, and the final approval of that manuscript in order to be submitted. Because anyone who's an author on a paper takes full responsibility for the content of that paper. So if you're listed as an author, you're responsible for what that paper says. You own that paper. So you, as if you're going to be an author, you have to have final approval. There is a group that actually has a list of criteria. It's called the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. And this is a group that has set standards for what authors need to do. 
So they have to have substantial contribution to the conception and design of the work, one. And you know, they have to draft the work and revise it, and they have to have final approval, and they have to be accountable for it. So what you'll sometimes see in a list of authors is that someone, author number three, is data collection. Data collection does not an author make. And if that's all someone does is technically collects data, it's acknowledged in, in an acknowledgment. It's not an authorship criterion. And those are important things to realize, that everyone who is listed as an author must meet all four of these criteria in order to be listed as an author. And this is something we're pretty stringent with in the review. We, we take this pretty seriously and, and look at authorship. Now, in addition to that, um, we said that. There are categories of authorship that occur. These are, two of them are called honorary authorship and ghost authorship. Now, what's honorary authorship? What's an honorary author? Well, I've done my research and I'm going to send it in for publication, but in order for me to be allowed to do that, I gotta put my department chair and my lab manager and my kindergarten teacher and, you know, so, and, and these people had absolutely nothing to do with the study. You know, maybe the lab manager gave them the space that they're using. That does not make an author. You can put that in an acknowledgement. That's absolutely fine. So honorary authorship is also known as courtesy authorship or gift authorship. And you'll see this in various places. You'll see it in certain countries. You'll, you know, there are areas in which this will happen. And this is considered to be unethical. And we will look very carefully at this. And we will go back and we will strike these authors. We'll, we'll go back and tell the authors these people are not appropriate as authors. And it's interesting when we do that sometimes and you've probably seen this, is in the revision, all of a sudden the person who only collected the data now wrote the paper, revised the paper, designed the study, and now is responsible for it. So when you see that, you sort of look at that with a critical eye in terms of the integrity of the people doing the work. So these are important things. Honorary authorship is really not something that's appropriate and is considered unethical. Now, what's ghost authorship? Okay. Ghost authorship is something that has been very common, um, and a, an example would be <clears throat> Industry X approaches me and says, we want to write a paper on our latest and greatest eardrop. And doctor, you're a well-known person in the field. You don't have to do a thing. We have a team of medical writers that will write that for you, and you will be the lead author. We won't even put our names on it, and you got a publication. Thank you very much. Is that ethical? No. Okay. That's ghost authorship. And this is a this is misleading, it's deceptive, it's absolutely inappropriate. And you will spot these from time to time. So be aware of what we call ghost authorship. Redundant publication, things need to be published once. There's a concept called salami slicing. Do you know what that is? That's where you sort of take one database and you chop it up into little pieces and you publish five different papers based on the same data set. And that's also considered to be inappropriate and that's something we will not allow as editors. Um, and then finally, plagiarism. I like this cartoon. I need you to do a presentation on plagiarism. If you don't have the time to prepare anything, just steal it off the internet. Okay. So plagiarism, again, is something that we now have software packages that will scan for. And when you do your reviews, on the left column, you can go into Google Scholar, you can go into Deja Vu, you can look at other papers that have been written by same and similar people on the same topics, and you can pull those up and actually compare. And sometimes it's surprising how similar they are. And there are also software packages that will directly look at the percentage of similarity between papers. Now, Plagiarism occurs when you have large amounts of papers that are just cut and pasted into other papers. And this is unethical to the point of being reportable back to the chair and to the dean of the institution. This is considered a, an egregious breach of publication ethics. Um, really, it's anything where someone presents the work of others as their own or self-plagiarizes, takes their own work and republishes large portions of it as other articles. 
So these are also considered to be unethical. And you as a reviewer, these are things you're going to look for and, and, and be aware of. And keeping patient confidentiality is important. So I'm going to pass it back along to Dr. Rosenfeld to wrap us up. All right. Last few minutes to tie it together, and I know it's approaching uh, 12 o'clock. We're happy to stick around a little bit and talk if you have questions. So how do you write this all up? Well, you, you typically begin with a, f a few sentences to show that you understood the article. You know, so-and-so have published a, a, a very insightful article on blah, they found this, just to show that you read it and understood it. I think that's helpful. Um, some comments about, um, uh, general comments about the article. But then you quickly move into specific comments that can be linked to a page, a line number. Uh, and the key is to write something they can respond to. You say, well, you only studied 25 patients, you should need uh, 60. They can't do that, okay? You don't like the way the figure looked, fine. You don't like it, fine. You can say, well, I want you to do this. Don't just tell them what you don't like. Tell them what you want them to do. You know, make it easy for them to fix what the problem is. Don't just complain, okay? Be constructive. There's a problem with this. It should have been like this. You know, then they can respond to it. The confidential comments to the editors are often underused, but they probably should be used more. This is where you put the things you really don't feel comfortable. Well, you know, I think maybe this is a duplicate publication. I'm not sure. I remember they presented this or, you know, so-and-so didn't declare any relationships, but I think at the last meeting they were on the advisory board of this company. You know, stuff that you're thinking about or, Ah, it's not a great paper, uh, I'm really not, you know, it's blah, blah, blah. But you, it, it's the confidential stuff is very helpful uh, if you put that in there. The disposition, so what happens to these things? Very few are accepted initially. Very, very rare to have it accepted. Most go through either minor or major revision. Minor usually means it's very salvageable. And by the way, it, you can recommend this, but don't put it in the review. This is what the editor says. And if Jack is like I am, I would just delete it when it was in there. Uh, also, don't say anything nasty or incorrigible. I mean, be nice in the review. You know, be nice. <laughs> if it's a lousy manuscript and you're really nasty, then it becomes our problem. You know, it's like slamming the door. It doesn't matter why you slammed it, you slammed it, then it's the door slammer's problem. Uh, make revisions easy. Be explicit about what you want done. Often major revisions can be rejected. It's not a guarantee to acceptance, but most minors are. Rejection means it's got fatal flaws. We're not taking it. You can overcome rejections, and some of the papers you reject may be resubmitted. And don't take it personally, by the way, if you say it should be rejected, you don't know what the other reviewer said. And typically there's at least two reviews. The other reviewer may say major revision, and when the editor looks at it, they may say, yeah, you know, it, it really is a major revision. Don't take it personally. How dare they ask revision? I said that should be rejected. All right, you're not the editor, so it's not your decision. Or the other way around. Either. Or the other way around. Yeah. So uh, if your paper is rejected, you know, take your pulse, find out why, um, uh, check for data problems, and, and decide about resubmission. We, we get a fair amount of appeals at the journal. It would run anywhere between like 15 and 30 a year, I suppose. People would appeal a rejection. If they're appealing a case report rejection, it, it, it doesn't go anywhere. But other things, about two-thirds of the time, we'd let them resubmit if the appeal was reasonable. This is, you are fallible. We are fallible. This is a fallible process, so, you know, we can make mistakes, and that's why we allow appeals. Simple question in conclusion, does all the work you do as peer reviewers, right? Some of you spend a half hour, some spend an hour, some spend a few hours analyzing a paper. Does it help ensure the quality of published research? Hmm. Well, we have a review in JAMA from a few years back that showed it probably makes no difference. We don't know if it does or doesn't. And then the same author, a few years later, did a Cochrane review and decided there's little empirical evidence to show it works, but, you know, we need something, so we might as well keep doing it, right? So don't be too full of yourself. That's, that's the whole point there. We're all fallible. Um, caveat lector, you know, let the reader beware. 
I think I, I saw this sign. I was in uh, South Africa. You know, it was uh, a sign. You know, beware of charging. You know, rhinos and bulls and anything else coming. So, uh, always keep an open mind and beware. It's not a substitute for critical assessment of journal articles. Uh, people have to be sharp and astute. So, it's coming up on exactly. 12, we thank you for coming and we're happy to stay mm -hmm. uh, for a few moments and answer any questions. Happy reviewing.